Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. You can hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sec. Yeah. Uh, this is the um, the uh, kind of the 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 fourth, but also it's third in a series that we've been doing on the on the short history of the left. Uh, my name is Adoni Melithopoulos. I'm the chapter head at the uh, um, the platypus chapter in Corvallis at Oregon State University. Um, this this um, series is being put on by the West Coast chapters of the Platypus Affiliated Society in LA, Santa Cruz, the Bay Area. Uh, and so if you're new and you're interested in uh, connecting, uh, we have uh, weekly reading groups, uh, weekly meetup. And this week uh, weekend, we're concluding our international uh, conference, um, which is virtual this year. And tomorrow, I believe it's 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern, uh, we have our concluding panel, which is uh, a very similar topic to tonight. Anybody remember what the title is? Oh, there we are. Is there like a decade on the left? Decade on the left, fantastic, great. Okay, so, um, uh, tonight's teach-in. So the 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 um, this series, uh, the intent was to fill in the gap spanning the history of the left from the 19th century to the present day. Uh, the series is based on one of the founding documents of the Platypus Affiliated Society, a short history of the left. Uh, and I'll put the link in the chat um, um, for those of you who haven't seen it before. Um, uh, this week, uh, I'm pleased to have the teach-in that examines the death. Sorry, I'm admitting people at the same time. <laughs> the death of the millennial left, 2006 to 2016. Okay. I should not be doing both of these at the same time. The millennial left uh, emerged in the aftermath of the George W. Bush and war on terror and it extended through the financial crisis and economic downturn, Obama's election, the Citizen United decision and the Republican sweep of Congress. Occupy Wall Street and Obama's re-election, Black Lives Matter emerging from a disappointment with a black president. Its end can be marked with the 2016 election, which delivered the final blow to the millennials leftism. Uh, we're gonna have a presentation by Huang from the Corvallis chapter. And then after that, we'll have time for a, a discussion. That's gonna raise questions of what can be learned from this experience and what does this history mean for the left? And without, uh, without further ado, Huang, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, yeah, okay. So um, welcome everybody. I'm Huang, I'm also a platypus member at the Corvallis chapter. Um, I guess I have a short presentation that I've written up and I just read out. And then I'll open it up to Q and A and kind of informal discussion. Okay, so um, okay, uh, it might seem strange to recount the history of the millennial left. After all, what exactly has the millennial left accomplished? No new social movements or organizations have been created. No major achievements have been accomplished. Indeed, it is even difficult to even define what the millennial left was. Was it the anti-war movement, Occupy, BLM, the Sanders campaign, or maybe DSA? Perhaps it is both all and none of these things. For what all these phenomena represent is not a historical achievement, but the necessity of historical task a task that was inherited from the history of the left in which the millennial left failed to advance. Coming of age in the early 2000s, the, early co the earliest cohort of millennials were first politicized by the events of 9-11 and the subsequent invasion of Iraq in 2003. 
participating in the massive anti-war protest of the early 2000s, millennial activists were being introduced to the dismal legacy of Marxism through the phenomenon of the Marxist sects, organizations such as the ISO, um, the World Workers' Party, the RCP, which had organized some of the early protests against the war. We're introducing a new generation to the leftist tradition of anti-war and anti-imperialist politics. Being both inspired and repulsed in equal measure by this history, the millennial left reached back to the earlier periods of the new left and sought to revitalize the spirit of the 60s anti-war movement. As a result, some millennial activists began contacting new left veterans to seek advice and with their assistance, revived the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, in 2006. During that year, students from around the country organized the first SDS national convention since the breakup of the organization in 1969. It was here at the convention that the new SDS was warned against reproducing the new left and repeating its mistakes. In this spirit, Platypus was formed in December 2006 as an attempt to take seriously this challenge, to ask what it would mean to understand not just the history of the new left, but the history of the left as a whole, as a history of failure, and how interrogating that question could help contribute to the reconstitution of left-wing politics in the 21st century. Platypus's first engagement with the left was on the issue of imperialism. Here, it became increasingly apparent that the millennial left, along with the sectarian organizations, were abusing the concept of anti-imperialism towards dubious political ends. The issue came to a head when, shortly after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi Communist Party released a public statement stating their intentions to work with the US-backed coalition government criticized the Western left for advocating the immediate withdrawal of troops from Iraq, which they argued would only bring more violence and instability to the region. This statement was roundly dismissed by the Western left and the Iraqi Communist Party was denounced as lackeys of imperialism. Instead, when the Western left side, uh, the Western left side with the Islamist resistance against the coalition government on the grounds of anti-imperialism. Anti-imperialism was no longer a form of left politics, but instead a thought taboo, an article of faith that simply cannot be questioned. This revealed not only the collapse of any international politics on the left, a problem which is already manifest in Stalinist old left, but also the ways in which the millennial left was being weighed down by the legacy of the new left. The 1960s strategy of weakening the US political standing at home through a military defeat abroad, a strategy which had already failed during its time, was now being resur resurrected as if nothing had changed in the intervening 40 years. Tries they may, millennial left could not turn Iraq into Vietnam. <clears throat> the moment of crisis for the anti-war movement came with the election of Barack Obama in 2008. Two critical issues were at play during that election. Obama's stances on the war and the issue of black politics. In mulling the issue of anti-imperialism, it no longer became clear what opposition to the war even meant. This allowed Democrats like Obama to run on an anti-war platform and lead the political discontent with the war that had bubbled up by 2008. The left played its part by focusing almost exclusively on the failures of the Bush administration failing to recognize the ways in which both Obama and Bush's stance on the war were similar. After all, what difference does it make whether the troops are withdrawn, quote unquote, when the security situation allows it or when the mission has been accomplished? That was the ways that Obama and Bush had um, pitched their foreign policy. Um, another issue which came up during the campaign was the question of race. What was remarkable about the Obama campaign was how little its success was premised on the black politics of the Democratic Party. Indeed, Obama's success relied on bypassing this kind of politics altogether. 
here, it seems as if the new left assumptions about the necessity of black politics and its progressive character were being called into question by the social reality itself. Instead of using the opportunity to critically reflect on this historical legacy, the millennial left held steadfast to its inherited dogma. This prevented them from understanding Obama for what he is, a conservative black politician. With the election of Obama in 2008, the political movements of the early 2000s, from the anti-war movement to the immigrants' rights movement to the USDS, all collapsed. The Marxist sectarians, who were once so prominent at anti-war protests, fell oddly silent in the face of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. The next wave of popular protests came with the Occupy movement in 2011. Here, it was not the 60s anti-war movement, but the 90s anti-globalization movement that was being emulated. Seeking a clean break with the political traditions of the past, Occupy rejected any attempt at political leadership in place of concrete political demands or programs. Um, the politics prefiguration prevailed as a unifying force. The idea being that if only people could see a new form of consensus democracy at work, they would at once rally behind the left. What resulted instead was an increasingly bureaucratic and cumbersome method of deliberation, which failed to make progress on any major political questions, producing nothing but vague statements against the status quo, i.e. the 99% versus the 1%. What started out as an ambitious attempt to rethink politics ultimately ended as a resistance movement registering discontents with the Democratic Party, bringing about neither reform nor revolution. Um, with the 2012 re-election of Obama, Occupy also succumbed to the same fate as the anti-war movement before it. What was left was kept alive by a handful of activists carrying out meager anti-austerity protests and quote unquote left unity projects such as the DSA, Democratic Socialist America. Thus began the slow death of the millennial left as it chased after every fleeting popular discontent generated by a collapse in neoliberalism from BLM, the Me Too, Super Sanders, and Donald Trump each time hoping that this or that protest can be turned into a mass movement, i.e. that it can be used to save the left. It was for this purpose that the millennial left had finally unified under the umbrella of the DSA. What started as an attempt to radicalize the progressives attracted to the Sanders campaign has ended up becoming an excuse for the left to resolve into the Democratic Party. Socialism was being redefined as a realignment of the Democratic Party's electoral base as progressivism. In the process, the original vision of the SDS and Occupy of creating an independent left that can transcend the new left and break with the Democrats and Republicans alike faded into the background. The millennial left, in abandoning its raison d'etre, have failed to become something truly independent and new following in the footsteps of the new left, which itself had failed to overcome the failures of the old left, the millennials have shown themselves to be nothing more than the continued historical regression of the left stretching back to at least the 1930s. Whatever potential it once had is now gone. When we in Platypus say that the left is dead, we mean that the left is, to paraphrase Rosa Luxemburg's, a rotting corpse. It cannot be cured of its ailments, nor brought back to life. The only use it can be made now is as fertilizer. The possibility for any future emancipatory politics can only be found not in the revival, but in the continued decomposition of the dead left. Um, so yes, that was my the end of my concluding remarks, the prepared remarks. Um, so I guess we'll open up for discussion and any questions or comments that people may have. Yep, that was great. Thanks so much, Huang. Um, yeah, is there any, there we go. Um, it, I, my sense is most of the people um, 
in the room have been at, or in the convention have attended the convention and have seen you know some of the recent panels um uh, Huang, I, I guess I'm kind of curious, Huang, how, you know, how you view, as somebody, I guess, as somebody who was in the DSA at one point and politicized before most of this history, um, how, do you, how does, I don't have a full question, but I was just like, the extent to which um, you felt that you were encountered any of this history. I remember you, there was DSA educational nights and things like that, but the extent to which, you know, how the hit, how the last 10 years was sort of uh, before, outside of platypus, you were introduced to it or how, how you came across it. Um, yeah, so I guess because of my age, my really main experience with the left was through the DSA. Um, and of course, there you really do get the sense that like the millennial left started um, with Occupy, like that, you know, the present day politics that I encountered was kind of trace its route back to that kind of 99% versus 1%. Like protest politics and um, kind of, yeah, and people trying to like evaluate the ramifications of that and trying to do left unity around the failures of Occupy. Um, so yeah, I didn't get much of that like history um, before Occupy really. Um, and also actually I didn't really, to be honest, get much of the history uh, of Occupy itself. I think a lot of the tendency seems to be that um, DSA is like, what we have now is like an advance beyond Occupy. And as such, it's kind of not really as important to look, look back on what Occupy was. Thanks, Juan. Thanks. I was wondering if you could talk about like more about the situation, the context in which you joined the DSA. Do you consider yourself a millennial leftist? Uh, you, um, and yeah, like if you could speak to the, you know, your politicization or, or depoliticization or, you know, disillusionment or what have you. Yeah, so, um, my experience with DSA is pretty brief. It was really only in college. Was, um, and this was after 2016, um, after the Trump election. So I guess, yeah, so actually my, my first experience with it is being introduced to life was actually through a platypus event because it was at the, our, 1968 panel that the Corvallis chapter hosted um, that I met a bunch of like people my age who were trying to restart um, at the DSA in Corvallis. And at that time, I think some of that effort was also spearheaded by um, the new leftists who were living in the area. I think um, Rich was part of the person trying to lead and rally people around that kind of cause. Um, and yeah, my experience with the DSA during the kind of in between the 2016 and 2020 election cycle was mainly one of people trying to do base building and activism. And it was clear that most of the attempts was trying to, you know, provide, trying to recruit the Bernie people who had, you know, maybe had gone sour with the Democratic Party or, and to kind of keep them politically engaged. 
um, in the meantime. But I did feel as though the attempt to kind of go beyond that to like generate new movements or new momentum never really got off the ground. And the DSA had always been kind of stuck with this, you know, post Bernie kind of momentum, but not really getting moving it anywhere. And so it, yeah, it kind of became like a, you know, giving the Bernie people something to do in the meantime while they were waiting for 2020. I don't know if that made any sense, but yeah. It did. I, I have a, another question along those lines, but Emilio, his mic's not working right now. So he, he had a great question. Um, he's wondering uh, if you see any similarities between the Trump pedagogy and the Obama pedagogy. And it, you know, clearly you've gone back and read some of the pieces from the Obama era. Uh, but Amelia wants to know, both seem to point to the left's inability to take up these figures as learning opportunities of what is changing in capitalism and their own capitulation to conservative politics. So uh, Amelia's question is, do you see, do you see similarities? Because they're all, in some ways, the style is a little bit different because Democrat, Republican, and Trump as a kind of, you know, but yeah, how do you sort of view the, you know, the, the writings around those two figures. Um, yeah, I definitely see the point that there are um, similarities between the Obama and Trump Trump um, pedagogy. Um, it seemed, yeah, because I did. Sorry, I have to think about this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I would say it seemed in retrospect, maybe the, um, the question of whether Trump had, might have been more successful than Obama in terms of his like post neoliberalism. Um, was raised for me. Um, and also, yeah, because I guess in both cases, the left did kind of hold on to its kind of traditional, you know, view on things like race and, you know, defending the welfare state or whatever. Um, yeah, but it seems like the second time around, with the Trump president, there was definitely much more hysteria around Trump. Um, much more like, you know, accusations of fascism and stuff, which I guess you didn't see before. Um, That's interesting to me. You know, there's a, there is a kind of way in which, um, you know, I remember when we, we, you know, when we're reading some of the early pieces about the Obama presidency, the way in which uh, people couldn't quite, uh, you know, the way in which Obama wanted to distance himself from Reverend Wright, for example, and um, Jesse Jackson, you know, being really, really mad about Obama's, you know, um, not paying, you know, proper respect to that or whatever. I'm not, I wasn't quite sure exactly, maybe, some of the older members from Chicago can remember that period, but that there was a way in which the left projected on Obama all sorts of things that he wasn't, which they kind of, I guess, did for Trump as well. But there is the point of like, you know, the, I guess, you know, the, I, yeah, but there's a kind of way in which like Trump actually reconfigured the political landscape in a way that Obama didn't, I suppose to reinforce it or something. Yeah. I just wanted to say two things on that, which is that something that was continuous amongst the Obama and Trump pedagogy would have been that we kind of wanted 
than to do the fullest possible, right? So you could be on the Obama team and you could be on the Trump team in, in a kind of sense of we wanted Obama to do like the fullest, like take all of the symptoms to the fullest degree, that kind of way in which Adolf Reed um, has described Obama as the, the hyphenated president. And if you look back at Chris's remarks on the Obama panels, like progress or regress, he kind of makes this point as well as Richard Rubin in um, like the platypus synthesis. Um, and likewise with Trump, the infamous go Trump go, right? In yeah. other words, you might as well have the person do the fullest that their ideology can come to bear um, in that sense. And so to me, that's a continuity between Obama and Trump. Right. And I always like would point out, um, you know, when I guess Platypus would be accused of being like Trumpist, I would point out, as, as was just brought up by um, Emilio and, and discussed by Juan right now, um, actually that continuity between those two different approaches, even though they would be considered completely different, right, like night and day. And in a sense, actually going to Andoni's point, what the left projected on Obama and what the left projected on Trump actually reveals what their kind of desires were, which is that they wanted Obama with Trump's economy and Trump with Obama's economy, right? So they were, like up until the COVID crisis, they were very unhappy that Trump had a booming economy. And likewise, in terms of Obama, and this is kind of coming back with the Biden presidency right now, they were unhappy that Obama was not going to be this, you know, new New Deal person. Right, that in fact he was going to take the more conservative position, that his stimulus was basically the same one as George W. Bush, that he wasn't going to listen to Christy Romer. She floated the one trillion um, in 2008. Right. And that in fact we were going to have, and this is going back to the background of Occupy, we were going to have the Democrat be seemingly checking all the right marks about what would be expected of a Democrat. And yet we would have stagnation, um, you know, like the early 2010s felt like stagnation and decay. Maybe it's because I was on the job market and could not get a job anywhere. But like, it really did feel like, what, why did I do anything at that time? Um, yeah, sorry if that was a digression. That was really useful, actually. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I was just going to say um, one thing that, being on, on the millennial left, one thing that really appeared to me was the uh, real unpreparedness. Ryan. Yes. Yeah. There's something about your audio that is a little dim. You mean I don't know if you... Yeah, that's better. Okay. One one thing that uh, being on the millennial left, one thing that really struck. Sort of upon reflection is how sort of this feeling of unpreparedness by the millennial left that post 9-11 sort of the like politics re-emerged and global politics sort of crashed onto the millennial left in a way where I sort of reflected on the like the what the the post-political left had passed on to the millennial left that there was this feeling that society wasn't political in, in the old ways and that the old problems were somewhat resolved in, in, in mystical ways. And the theory, like reading Zizek and Graeber and Fisher, really just left this sort of bizarre confusion. And that when, uh, after the global financial crisis, that sort of solidified and just became this scramble to, to find other you know, political ideas that were out there. People moved into various Trotskyism or other things in a kind of just this very spontaneous way. And I think that was sort of my biggest reflection was that it, the millennial left just had this sense of confusion and unpreparedness throughout its whole operation that, and that ultimately led to its sort of impotence. I have a question sort of riffing off that. So, you know, just with my experience being a, um, like a DSA participant, um, one of the things I've always been struck by is how young DSA members are, even by like millennial standards. Um, so, you know, like I think the oldest millennials are now uh, on the upper end of 30. 
And DSA is sort of like an in your 20s kind of organization for the most part, or it seems that way. So I guess what I'm wondering, and this, you know, kind of goes to Ryan's point about, you know, sort of inexperience and uh, like unpreparedness for everything. But to what extent does it even make sense to talk about the millennial well, millennial left as like one, um, one generation, as opposed to, you know, maybe like two or three, or maybe more like two, even shorter, more abortive generations than this millennial left category would be. Yeah, I guess I kind of touch on uh, on it in my presentation a little bit, which is to say, like, to what extent all these movements in the 21st centuries are like coherent, or whether you can say there's continuation. Um, and we, yeah, which is why I kind of posed that idea of like well, maybe the millennial left is like a historical task. Like it's it's a challenge that has to be met of like um, reckon, uh, reckoning with the history of the dead left and of maybe overcoming its historical limitations. And that in that sense, all the kind of different groups like, you know, the SDS, the anti-war movement, Occupy, and to a certain extent also DSA as well, are all trying to answer the same, trying to deal with the same task in their different ways. Now, you know, they might not be successful, but that's kind of the, I would say the thread that ties them together. I don't know if that, I guess that indirectly maybe touches on your question. I don't know if anybody else has other thoughts. Well, I mean, it kind of is a question of like, well, what is a millennial? It seems like, you know, like, where do we draw these generational boundaries? Is it, two, is it really like, is it one group? Can we say it is, or is it two? That seems like Conrad's point. I would say that like, um, Sure, I mean, you can always subdivide or you could draw the distinctions differently. I think that there is a generational, there's something to be said for like kind of, uh, I don't know, like in the early 2000s moment, like in some sense, like coming to like so being socialized in some, in some sense with the internet. And I think that's something that we sort of have in common, just like as a, generational experience that I think that people in their, you know, mid twenties and, you know, later in their thirties kind of share. Whereas I think it's possible and who knows that like, you know, people like, I, I was just going to ask Huang, do you consider yourself a millennial? And also like, you know, do you feel like a generational divide with freshmen in college? And I would, my sort of hunch is like, maybe, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, you should answer that question. But and just like, if for nothing else, like the you know, I, everybody here, if you went to college, like you had a freshman year, <laughs> right? And like, I think that the you, that experience is pretty different. I don't know, but I mean, what that like that's this is like super like this is like you know social, cultural. It's less directly. Um, political but, um, yeah I guess in the US the the experience has been cuz you know when we were around when we started in platypus you and I there was I I'm Gen X and I I remember the 90s I went through the 90s and experienced it and I I felt different with your generation and sort of like there there was a different kind of t uh, tempo to things and I don't mean in terms of like technology and sensibilities, but politically there with the anti-war movement, there did seem to be a way in which the nineties had fallen behind. Then the nineties seemed to come back in some ways with Occupy. Like I, I recognized it. Like I was very, I remember 
you know, there's discussion on the list about how, how some people, you know, were kind of horrified by Occupy, but that was like my milieu, the drums, and that was what I grew up with. <laughs> right. The dream of the 90s, the dream of the 90s is alive in Portland. I thought that yeah, was well, like at the you know, same I'm, time. I'm sitting like, in a parking like... lot in Portland right now, so yeah. No, but the, but I think that that the, there's a there was a different sense, and the, the uh, uh, but even the 90s and with the Obama president, there was something that you know I felt a little out of out of place even with Occupy, and the question is like now with where does coming back to Conrad's question, where does this line? Because you look at the DSA now, and it's full of people who are really, really, really young. And to what extent are they, like, the people who who are politicized, like Huang, and maybe even Conrad, with 2016, who come after, you know, what what you know we might call like the death of the millennial left, people who came in after that point, the extent to which it has, because what Huang described was this. Kind of perpetually waiting for Bernie to come back. That that was his kind of political experience. It was like, is Bernie coming? And then when Bernie never came back, it kind of like it took the wind out of everything, which may have been different from people earlier. But I, I don't know what people think about that. But I had this thought come to my head as as well as both based on what uh, Gabe had said earlier, and, and then also what you just said, Anthony, which is that you know one of the things. Not to make it too platypus centric, but you know, often in platypus, we'll talk about actually the potential in the new left being earlier than how they imagine it, right? Post facto, that they kind of imagine it coming at the latter part of the 60s, that it's 1968 is the world crisis, and you can even track it in music. It's like Sgt. Pepper's to the White Album or something. But um, likewise, as well, you know, in retrospect, and this is what happened when I was on that panel. Uh, and this was an earlier question. It's like, oh, the millennial left starts with the Bernie campaign and that that's going to be like the shining moment of the millennial left. Whereas, you know, we've been trying to get at, and it's not to say that Occupy, you know, I'm not like entirely sanguine on it. I'm just looking at the way in which certain parts of the earlier part of the um, 2010s and latter part of the 2000s as well, meaning I don't have as much direct experience with the anti-war movement. I was overseas and everybody around me was telling me the United States is the worst country in the world. That was my experience of the anti-war movement. Um, you know, yes, like, I had that too. I had that experience. Yes, yes, I was going to an international school while the U.S. was invading Iraq and being told like, Danny, why are you responsible for this? I was like 11. So <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, but my, my point being that those earlier moments of, of potential, how to read those out of the, uh, the history, the trajectory, right? In other words, the Bernie campaign, which looks like a culmination, that could actually be the product of already a uh, missed opportunity that by necessity had to lead into a presidential campaign, right? In fact, when I first heard the Bernie Sanders campaign, I went, well, that's because people have been wishing for something independent for the last five years. And because nothing was actually actualized, right? This kind of came up on the panel as well, like Rick Wolf, um, you know, thinking for a second, we need like some kind of new party that consequently that energy must be directed into Bernie Sanders. It wasn't that, I don't know, Jack of Ben Sheepdog them or the DSA, but that was the only place that that outlet could, could um, find a, uh, a form. There's a better word for that, but yeah. I have to think about that, Danny, because there's a, you know, there's a... It, it seems rings true to me. I do remember after Occupy, you know, following the people who I engaged in, in Halifax when I was up there and following them on Facebook, a lot of them, so, there was a small number of them that got involved with municipal politics, uh, unaffiliated without an organization. There was, I think there were these- Shama broad... Salant. Shama Salant. That's well, I mean, why... she, was, yeah. she, was, she was a socialist alternative though. But there were people. Oh, there were unaffiliated. people. Yeah, there were occupyish kind of people who 
got involved in civic life after Occupy at, 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 in no organization. They just, they were kind of, they wanted to, but you know, you could see them, you could see that basis being where, you know, having nowhere to go, as you put it. And then when Bernie Saunders candidacy is announced, if, you know, it snaps into a focus for a lot of those people that, you know, they were, you know, the, after Occupy, there's just nothing around. And there was, a, you know, there was a lot of new people that came in at that time who floated around and, and did various things, but were not in any kind of organization. I think I mean, without, oh, go, go ahead. No, I guess the, the weird thing is like why, you know, it's like the DSA, I, th I think Chris brought this up in a teach-in that, you know, if, if you had if you had said the DSA was going to be this organization that was going to grow of all the sectarian groups, I remember this uh, being at a convention when um, um, Sawant got the you know the the electoral position in Seattle. Everybody said the ISO is going to dissolve; it's going to be socialist alternative. And I remember mm -hmm. arguing with somebody, and they said, "No, no, no, the ISO is way too strong. That's overstating it." Nobody. But it said it was the DSA, right? It, it, it seems very bizarre that, like, except that Jacobin was there, kind of. Like, it it seemed like it, the it seems very kind of accidental that it was the DSA that was the beneficiary of this. You know, there's even this question of did Jacobin imagine, if you go back and read that first issue, that they would be where they were ten years later? Like, it had you know, this was during a period when like there were all sorts of like blogosphere things popping up. The new right? inquiry. The new inquiry. The North Star. You remember them, right? I do. Yeah. Um, and so Jacobin seemed to be like, yeah, this is kind of like everybody. And it, maybe it even felt more insular. That I mean, I know there's a necessity of as you grow, you're, you're going to eventually not be as insular just because you're going to have a greater readership and more popularity. And there's also just the need of of maintaining the magazine. Sorry. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, what, okay, see, I was at the Platypus Convention in 2011. I was in the DSA. There was a DSA, uh, what is it? Not, not a teach, is it a teaching? What was the word that we would use, Gabe? Night school. No, no, we called it the uh, differing perspectives on the left. Differing perspectives on the left. And I'm sitting there watching the DSA person and Richard Rubin asked, so do you consider Finland a socialist country? And they said, yes. And I was like, uh-oh. Right, and I was in the DSA at the time, and I was like, "Yeah." And you know, I, I guess seven years later, six years later, eight years later, like now they're filled with Marxist-Leninists, which I could not imagine at all. It's like you joined the DSA to not be a Leninist when I was an undergrad, right? Because you thought Lenin's authoritarian; it's hierarchical. We're democratic socialists. So that you know, that kind of that surge, uh, it makes sense why it could not be foreseen, but that's because I guess we expected the DSA to remain like the DSA, whereas really this is something different today. Um, sorry, somebody else talk. No, Conrad, Conrad, you, I cut you off uh, earlier. And, they, and if anybody else wants to raise your hand, we'll get you in the queue here. Yeah, I was going to try to weave together um, a couple things and follow up on my own comments from earlier about like, a divided generation or whatever. I mean, you were saying how after Occupy, there didn't seem to be anywhere for people to go and they just kind of went all and did whatever. And um, Gabriel, you, you were talking about how like, you know, you can, from a sociological perspective, you can kind of divide people up wherever based on their experiences or what have you. And I'm wondering, and you know, I haven't been alive for very long, so I wouldn't be an expert on this, but it often seems like, um, you know, in terms of politics, that things are moving very fast or things kind of jump around very quickly and yet sort of nothing happens, right? And I wonder if, um, if in the past things moved slower and it seemed like more happened or something like that in the new left or in the eighties, that is to say like, was there more continuity between, um, you know, uh, like anti-apartheid and um, 
you know, going up to like Seattle and the anti-war movement, or did there seem to be, then there seems to be with uh, like, you know, Occupy or the new SDS and now Bernie and DSA. And could some sort of alternative generational periodization capture, um, like if that is the case, could an alternate period periodization capture what's going on a little bit better than this uh, like millennial left category? So can I just, it seemed like you were kind of responding to my response. So I wanna respond again, <laughs> just on that question. I think, um, well, so I'm, I can like, I'm a, I'm a, you know, older millennial, but I have older brothers who are kind of like, you know, late or like, you know, old, you know, really young Gen X, but like kind of on the fringe. So, you know, one of my brothers is like an activist and like, you know, went to the battle in Seattle and was arrested and, you know, didn't give his name and was in prison for weeks or whatever. And like that, so that was like a jet, like that was an experience that like I had in the nineties sort of vicariously through him or like looked up to him, you know, but like I was kind of too young to do that, but he was also pretty young at the time. So I think that there is like, but that feels to me pretty um, like of a really different moment politically than the anti-war movement. And like, I'm sure like it was a, a lot of the same people were there, but like, to me, that feels really different. And I don't know. I think that the anti-war movement and the founding of the SDS feels much closer to Occupy. Also, because I personally, I know like, you know, the, you know, the leaders in some of the, you know, young, youthful, you know, leaders in the SDS went on to be leaders in Occupy. And there is like, there is like a, there is a thread that seems to be there. Um, maybe that was a little bit disjointed, but that's kind of how I see it. Um, I imagine you could see it differently. I think that like, yeah, I like, I don't know. Again, it's like, how do you, how do you, what do you, what is a generation? What is a common experience? What is like the, what are like touch points in history that sort of shape us culturally that we're responding to? And it, 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 it is like those kind of like cultural, social, and like more than political touch points because the politics is usually more veiled. And like, as you say, like not much changes, but there are changes. I mean, like there are, you know, it's, and it's like connected to a, a lot in, in large part, like the electoral cycle and like different events that kind of like happen. Um, yeah, that's a little disjointed, but. You know, yeah, I mean, things are happening. Disjointed too. No, things are happening. I wonder, you know, this could just be a, like difference in perspectives, like you older millennial, me um, kind of on the younger end of millennial uh, range, looking at it from our respective vantage point, points. Um, yeah, I'm, it, it's just sort of a bugbear of mine that going to DSA meetings, you always sort of get the feeling that uh, like no one knows what they're talking about or can tell you anything about anything. I think that the other thing is like, um, you, you know, for millennials, by and large, our teachers in high school were Gen X and our professors were boomers. <laughs> I mean, okay, that's not totally true, but there is like a little bit of truth to that. And so there's the way in which we can start to talk about like the, like the way that generational experience is like transmitted in terms of ideas generationally. Uh, and yeah, we, so we I, I think that like, for, well, just one more thing. So I think yeah. that the people that like, like millennials who were, who were like more politically act, like active earlier when they were younger, like had a more of a Gen X like we're, you know, more connected to the Gen X experience, both like historically, but also because like they were in high school and their teachers were Gen X and like that was like their context in which they were, that's what they were learning. Uh, whereas later, like later millennials, it's like a different, there's it, a different political moment, uh, maybe, I don't know. The, the reason why I think the generational um, 
this categorization works is because it's what the millennials gave themselves. So it's based on their self-understanding. So in the same way that the new left said, we need a new left, and it's not just as Oglesby puts it, uh, like the next generation of the left, but it's going to distinguish against things that came before it. The millennial left distinguished itself against, oh, we're not in the Cold War anymore, right? We're millennial Marxists. We're not afraid of socialism anymore, um, right? In the way that perhaps even the, you know, maybe Generation X was, and that's why they tried to do something different, Definitely. right? And so um, that's why. And, and even if, like, obviously there's, uh, I, I guess, Conrad, what you're getting at is like, there, there's more continuity than perhaps they think, like there might be something latent or subterranean that actually combines all these groups. Of course, that's that's one of the things that I think Platypus brings out, but ideologically how it was expressed is that nowhere the millennial left and not these preceding groups. And likewise, the first issue of Jacobin is, Bhaskar has this article, why we love the Zap Batistas, and so he's distinguishing himself against the Generation X leftists by saying this is why they look to the Zapatistas and we're not going to. They lived in under the Cold War and they were looking for some kind of third option. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, yeah, sorry. Somebody else. Yeah, wait, just a, a, like as a like an anecdote, I remember like being in college and like in Cosmo or like Teen Vogue or like some like those are different magazines, There's, like some kind of like, you know, pop teen like culture fashion magazine there was like a you know it like it was like here you know what is like a hipster wear right and like one of the things was like a Marx Engels reader and like I thought that was weird at the time but like also like it kind of made sense right because it's like you know like the millennials are in college and we're reading Marx and like that was, was like the hipster aesthetic no no, it, right, but that, I mean, it, I guess it could have been, but it wasn't, no, it wasn't. It was Mark Singles. I wanted to ask Huang, um, you know, the, looking back over this history, do you, do you uh, find yourself, um, you, you talked about the task that the millennial left, um, was was faced with and you know the extent to which nothing new came out of it and you know all those things what do you what do you think the tasks of the millennial left were as distinct from the new left do you see them as being like very a very similar set of problems or do you see them as new problems or from kind of mining through this history in preparation for the teach-in uh, what what do you think of that Hmm. Um, I would say that, you know, insofar as the millennial left had a tendency to hold on to kind of established leftist beliefs about, you know, like race or when the working class or about feminism or like queer politics. Um, I think one of the tasks really was to kind of re-examine that history and to re-examine how that those politics have changed in the 21st century. So I think in that sense, um, the task would really be to um, not take kind of the new left politics for granted or to treat them as if it hasn't changed. Um, you know, which, you know, perhaps is kind of a vague answer. Um, I'd have to think more about it, but. You know, yeah. it makes me think your, your presentation reminds me of Danny's presentation uh, last week where Danny sort of had this, you know, uh, anecdote of you know read well not anecdote he was reading Leo Panitch's uh, interview from 2010 and at the time I, I remember being struck it was like oh because I you know I feel like my introduction to Marxism was Leo Panitch uh, but that in hindsight the Marxism was used to justify accommodation that it wasn't used in a way 
to sort of like what you're describing of like recognizing change and being able to understand it in terms of like um, the, fr the freedom problem or in terms of, um, you know, tasks of socialism. It was really, it almost seems retrospectively as a justification for keeping things, for, for falling behind in fact. Uh, that was a really great part of your presentation, I, 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 and I and just thinking of it in in light of you know Danny's presentation the week before. I don't know if others had a similar kind of response to it, but that was really good. Sorry, there's a question in the chat as well. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan's question I was about to ask. If, do we want to read that question? Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I'm working off a smartphone here, so. I can, so Ryan, I'll, I'll read it, I'll read it. Yeah, um, please, go, okay. go for it. So Ryan uh, writes, we touched on this a bit with the comments about the internetization of leftism for millennials, but I was wondering what we'd think about the characteristic autodidacticism of the millennial. Uh, left? How is this an obstacle or an advantage? So Ryan's asking about the autodidactic character, um, you know, very prevalent, especially in the last five, six years. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious about what, how much the autodidacticism was there, like in the earlier periods, like in the anti-war movement or in the Occupy. I guess to a certain extent, maybe Occupy, there was that. Um, but yeah, like to what extent that was the case and to what extent they were, um, the millennials were still being taught socialism from like the sectarian orgs. I'll just say something quick, although I, I want to hear like, uh, Gabe on this as well. I feel like Gabe would have something to say. Um, my copy of Das Kapital, I got from the People's Library of Occupy Philadelphia. So... The reason I bring that up is because there was a lot of uh, books that were considered flammable, right? Books that were considered dangerous, that were being kind of pushed around, I feel like during Occupying Black Lives Matter. And this actually kind of goes to Gabe's earlier um, I, I anecdote about like, they were almost like symbols, like, oh, you're gonna read this, like, it, you know, like to, to express your militancy and radicalism. But I feel like what has happened in the latter part of the 2010s, um, especially with all of these podcasts, is like, oh, we're going to study them. Whereas I felt like earlier it was, it, it, it had, and I'm not saying that's good or worse. I'm just saying that my experience was that, you know, there's always been capital reading groups, like, you know, there, there will be that <laughs> forever. But like, my point being that um, I felt like the millennials after, the Trump thing was like, oh, we have to all become like sophisticated, like Marxists and know all of this stuff. And that that's and that might be also partly due to the explosion of this podcast that this kind of opened up like, you know, an avenue for everybody and their friend to get on the internet and do some like reading group and just kind of pontificate about these texts. Like I, I remember a few years ago doing the Platypus reading group in Houston and every second person that would come to the reading group would send me a new podcast of somebody reading like the communist manifesto. But I don't know, I'm, I'm curious what maybe uh, Gabe, I just to call Gabe out, but I feel like Gabe might have something to say about this autodidacticism in the earlier millennial part. Hey, can I just add to that, Danny? Yeah. Just just quickly, like, especially about the autodidactism, and this came up sort of in the fighter post in the Age of Zoom panel as well. It's like, is there a sense that people are really learning things from like listening to podcasts and just like going to websites? Is, is it like an effective tool to like for the next generation of left to learn? Or has it just become sort of like recitations of known facts? about you know, history i think that's sort of something i've known about podcasts is like people just listen to podcasts and they find certain podcasts to be authoritative on various subjects and then it just becomes a recitation of that as sort of dogmatically i, I was going to say that the the maybe the equivalent there's two things there's the independent media 
which the comes out of the 90s, which was really reportage. It was not about anything other than reporting events. But then there was popularizers like Zizek in the millennial left, who, you know, ha had this combination of being theoretical, but kind of vulgar. And so it seemed accessible in some ways. And so that, that you know, people would maybe have a similar, but I, yeah, Gabe, what do you, what, what's your thought on this? But I, I, I do remember kind of, we had popularizer, pop, we had this kind of like pop Marxism back then. Hmm. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, I remember, I mean, I remember seeing Zizek speak in college and it was a small room and it was so packed and people climbed in through the windows. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's different kinds of study, right? And like to learn something seriously is not just like podcasting and not to say that podcasts can't be interesting or nice to listen to. I listen to them. I think they're really interesting. I learned stuff on them. Uh, is, is autodidacticism like more of a like internet, Reddit, community, Reddit forum, Marxism thing? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe one way to put it is that there's always been autodidacticism. I mean, I went and read on my own. All of us have. I mean, sure. all, you know, everyone here is somehow intellectually uh, self-motivated, but that it's become a noticeable phenomenon. I think that's what Ryan is getting at. In other words, uh, just thinking about the, the stages of the millennial left, there's always been self-reading, but why did it appear in the latter part of the 2010s that this was a noticeable phenomenon of people coming to Marxism, not through some kind of protest, like it wasn't Black Lives Matter or Occupy, not through Bernie Sanders, but through Twitter, right? And through right. podcasts. And that, that that's, I guess, you know, what, what it seemed to be in Ryan's question was asking about that kind of autodidacticism. And not, Gabe, I know you're a very self-motivated what you love to learn me too great but like it, that i don't think was what was meant by the autodidacticism it was expressing why people were becoming marxists in the latter part of the time and also also in a way which it presented as a kind of eclecticism that like there was like a people were reading from like quite diverse set of, and even contradictory ideas and holding like somewhat contradictory positions and not sort of addressing those contradictions. I, um, I know someone in our local DSA chapter here who's like a PSU student. Um, she's sort of a, um, uh, you know, she has like a socialist realist picture of Lenin as her phone case um, and is sort of a, like a vaguely third worldist um, type of Stalinist person. And one day I was talking to her and I found out that she loves the book, uh, Time, Labor and Social Domination by Moish Pistone. <laughs> and I was just like, that's interesting. Have you read any of his other stuff? <laughs> you know, I guess the other thing just History to point out about this is that there would History have been- Right. There, there, the other thing is that I think most people would have you know got their marxism from the iso or something and so you would have you would have had eclecticism there as well it was curated in a specific way and it wasn't maybe as self-studied and there would be people around but it was also eclectic you know but like all right i mean my memories of the anti-war movement in 2002 were that like there were like sectarians fighting with each other like arguing and like selling papers and like wanting to like have arguments about all sorts of stuff at the protest. And I, I've been to protests since, and it's not the same. I don't know. Not to be like really nostalgic about it, but I feel like that's a difference. 
just like in the vitality of the sectarian left. No, that's but you that's can see right. It in but you would you would have that, but the, there is a way in which like the sectarian lefts, like you know, eclecticism was more, you know, you know, you would have the the thing is is like you would run into the you by the we're in the senile dementia of Marxism period uh, by Spartacus League, uh, you know, um, um, chronology. And so there's a way in which like already it's not as though you're getting, but at least the, you had the history of those organizations and that allowed Platypus in some sense to be able to engage, you know, when Kasama, for example, came up with, you know, there are all these new Maoist synthesis popping up before Occupy, it allowed us to kind of like bring up the history of Maoism and sort of like, you know, what is Badu and what is Zizhi and what are these different strains meaning historically in a way that the eclecticism at present is hard to kind of like, um, it's hard to pin down. Huang and I had this experience in the DSA in Corvallis and Huang, you may want to comment on it, but everybody had a different ideology in the DSA. There was the anarchist, there was the Stalinist, there was the Leninist, but none of them had any sense of their historical, well, they had a sense of history, but there, you know, it couldn't be brought to bear at all. They were not part of an organization. They weren't sure, it wasn't clear how these ideas got into their head in a way that if you went to the ISO and you learned you know, a certain kind of reading of Lenin, you could track it or something. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I can cut in for a minute here, um, just some, sort of along similar lines. <clears throat> um, it might be useful to like kind of just so, yeah, there, there was like eclecticism and there like there was sort of like a, a kind of, there were certain similar kind of like eclecticism, a certain type of autodidacticism, that sort of thing that people have been talking about around like, yeah, like, you know, the anti-war movement, um, you know, the like protesters who were at like the G20 protests in like I think it was 2009 or 2010, like in Pittsburgh or whatever. And like things like that. Um, and, and also like around Occupy, but like, I think maybe, so I mean, what's different is that with like the sectarian, with like the different groups is that they kind of, the history of their organization, like embodied, like their organizations embodied and kind of objectified a certain history, even if like that maybe wasn't very successfully reproduced, especially in like the younger recruits, like at that time. And, you know, that's not what we have. Um, so that's like a slightly different problem, you know? So certain things are kind of similar that like there was still like a great deal of like eclecticism, especially amongst like younger recruits, the ISO and stuff like that. You know, like, I mean, you, you had people who at these protests who, like, I, who were like with the ISO and identified as like ISOers and they probably like read Marx in like a reading group or something. But like, you know, you talk to them, they'd be like, yeah, like I'm reading Naomi Klein. That's really awesome. <laughs> you know, like there'd be, there'd be a, there could be that similar kind of thing. But so, so like that maybe hasn't radically changed. Um, but you know, what's different with the kind of breakup of those organizations is that whatever, however kind of like obscured and like maybe hard to access, there was still this like history of the 20th century left embodied in these different organizations. And, and you know, it, and, and it's kind of unfortunate that the DSA has, like, I mean, so like the DSA has like kind of transformed, but like it's, it's, it's very, that hasn't been like well-marked or something, I feel like. Right, um, and I don't know how like well that's been reflected on, especially by like younger members uh, in DSA, and like kind of reflected on kind of sem somewhat publicly or whatever. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not in the DSA, so I don't know about any of their internal conversations. But I don't think there's a lot of curiosity about that, um, which is unfortunate in a lot of ways. Um, so I think there's a like maybe less curiosity about. I don't know, or, or, or just thinking that all of these, like, you know, like older sectarian organizations in that history is just sort of like, okay, it's like, okay, boomer, or like, whatever. Um, and that's unfortunate. And that was maybe less the case around, that's maybe one thing that is different. Um, so, I mean, you know, kind of people will still be interested 
in Marx, Marxism, whatever. Um, and, you know, Platypus has, has its mission or its task to kind of like, you know, intervene in the kind of transmission of bad pedagogy, like all these different things. And like, that's not necessarily like different, but, you know, it is complicated and there is sort of a difference we should mark between when, when you had at, like the difference, which I think Gabe was kind of trying to get at between the kind of character of the protests and the way younger people who were drawn to the protests out of sometimes very, very general discontents or just, you know, right, uh, feeling that something is unjust, how they would potentially, the ways that they would be potentially open to interacting with the history of the left versus now, um, where the, the relationship is, uh, the, the relationship is instead of like being somewhat kind of like maybe skeptical, but, but like kind of naive, now it's like very much a kitsch relationship. It's like people who like call themselves Stalinists and like really, really have basically like call them weirdly like call themselves Stalinists or think that they have to read Stalin to justify like really very like right wing social democrat like views at best, but really probably even lower than that. Um, so in a way that's that's maybe more closed off than. And, and maybe a different type of obstacle and maybe a deeper obstacle to work through, if that, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I, I, uh, we, we're coming up to sort of time here. Um, and so I, I just wanna make sure other people who may have wanted to say something could, had a chance, of, but I did like Nate's last point. It did make me wonder one thing that's always been in the back of my mind is there was a sort of curiosity for people of your generation, Nate uh, and Gabe, um, about these issues in the history of the left. And I, I sort of wonder, you know, what, what if there will be something equivalent on the horizon, if that's possible with su such a, but yeah, you know, but I guess there was already disintegration by the time it came to you. So that, you know, maybe it's, it's like one of those asymptotic curves that you can, it just keeps coming back in some form, but, but I uh, wanted to see if there, anybody else um, uh, noticed some people were from different time zones and maybe um, just listening, but um, uh, Clint or Carson or Yi, uh, if you had anything you, or Emilio, I, Emilio, you don't have a mic, so, but if you had any, some last thoughts or anything that you wanted to get into the conversation. No, I guess the only thing that I would just sort of add going to the earlier thing um, is that and we've, we've talked about it some, but just about how the issue of generation is much more at the level of ideas and like imagination um, and like sort of like historical horizon is available. And I thought your presentation was great, Huang, because it showed how like these three different phases in the millennial left do sort of repeat different things, um, you, know, it, you know, ending in Occupy with the with with the uh, you know anti globalization, but also the um, Obama and race, and then the anti war, like we're going to have like another Vietnam, and like that that sort of repetition at a much more um, detritus level. That that's more more of the level of generations that um, we're dealing with. Um, but yeah, overall great discussion. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Clint. Anybody else before we uh, close up here tonight? Okay, great. We have to pace ourselves for the Sunday business meeting, which will be over Zoom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll require great stamina. Okay, thank you so much, Wong, and thanks for everybody who um, uh, participated in the series. And maybe we'll see if we'll uh, repeat something like this again. But uh, farewell from the West Coast, and uh, see you guys in the next few days. Thank you. Great job, Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Not one.